Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. I'll just do a quick sound check. Uh, if someone could just indicate whether they could hear us by chatting yes into the chat box, that would be much appreciated. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much uh, to those people. Now, uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, uh, my name is Patrick Nelson, I'm the MD of Reach Markets, and uh, we're hosting the session today. But the session is being run by Stephen Utomi Clark, who is the CEO and Managing Director of Precinct Therapeutics. And uh, it will be uh, running the, the presentation entirety of where I'll sit here as an MC. Uh, today's session is an open forum, so uh, we would encourage you, if you've got any questions, please type them into the chat box. And I will pose those questions to Stephen at the appropriate, at appropriate moment. If, the, if that comes up during the presentation, great. Otherwise, uh, we'll answer all the questions at the end in the Q&A session. So the, the session will move through the content fairly quickly. We'd aim to be th from one side of the presentation to the other in about 20, 25 minutes, and then we can go into any more detailed uh, answers uh, that you might have. Uh, it's been a busy year. I know for Stephen already, he's been on the road, uh, picked up uh, some, some viruses on the way. No oh. coronaviruses, thankfully. But, hopefully um, not. Hopefully not. Um, but um, it's been a busy start to the year and, um, and no doubt, and Steve will give us an update on all those things in just one moment. Just a few other housekeeping matters as we go. Um, I'll just bring up the uh, disclaimers, but uh, any advice contained in this presentation is general only. It doesn't take into consideration your personal circumstances. You need to decide whether it's appropriate for you. The uh, disclaimer for pre seeing up there just for one moment. If you'd like to ask a question, you, uh, well, if this is the first time you've been to a session like this, uh, to ask a question, you'll have a chat box in front of you. If the chat box is not open, there's a red arrow, top right-hand corner, click on that. It'll launch that chat box for you, and you can simply type it in. No one else in the audience can see the question, so feel free to say what's on your mind. Put that down. I'll read those questions out. If uh, there are a number of questions that are similar, I'll sort of paraphrase what I think you're asking into one question. If you feel that hasn't been given justice, then please re-ask your question, right? This session is recorded, uh, and uh, once it's gone through all the necessary compliance and so forth, we will publish. Uh, so if you should so choose to go back to it, um, then um, you can do that as well. So uh, there, the uh, session today is to give you a, an overview. If you're new to if you're new uh, to Precient, an overview of what Precient do, uh, how they've chosen to go about things, some of the developments of Precient in more recent times, and then. Uh, what's the, the, the what uh, Precient are going to be focused on in 2020? Um, Precient is an ASX listed company. The code of the company is PTX. So if it is not a company that you currently own, you can put it on your watch list uh, or you can purchase it. PTX is the code. If you've got questions following up to today's session, you can ask them by the Investor Centre or you can contact Reach Markets. Um, we manage the uh, investor communications side of things as well. So you can, you can come back to us and ask us any questions you've got one-on-one uh, -on -one if you so wish to at the end of this session. Um, so, but um, Stephen, I'll now hand over to yourself. Thank you very much and um, thank you to everyone that's taken the time to tune in both in Australia and overseas. I see a, a number of people there from, from overseas as well. And as Patrick said, I picked up a little bug in my travel, so I apologise in advance for any coughing and spluttering as I get over the last of this pneumonia. But um, again, apologies in advance. So once again, for those who aren't too familiar with Prescient, um, I realise there's a blended audience here, is that we are a um, personalised medicine company um, developing treatments for cancer. And I'll, I'll go into what that what that means and how that's changing from what some people might be thinking about um, about cancer. But to um, take a step back first to understand what we do, I think one must have a little bit of an appreciation for how cancer actually arises in the first place. And as that our cells divide over and over and over again, trying to make exact copies, um, or exactly correct copies, like copying out a book or a library of books, and invariably mistakes are made and sometimes these um, lead to mutations that cause the cell to divide uncontrollably and that's the definition of cancer. And what we are about is looking to address some of those mutations. There are many different types of mutations. Um, all of them, think of them like different types of switches, problematic switches. And we uh, 
are seeking to develop therapies to switch those particular mutations off. And if you look at this slide here, this is, this is basically cancer therapies that has been for decades where you have um, an indiscriminate drug, a drug that might be targeting, um, you know, targeting nothing in particular and everything in general, a fast growing cell, for example, and chemotherapy falls into this basket as do um, several other types of therapy. And you can see here is that it, it treats everyone the same. And of course, we know that is not true. Um, and you know some lucky patients might benefit, but uh, many more will not. And the worst of both worlds is where you don't receive any benefit, but you're exposed to all the uh, toxic side effects. So, <coughs> pardon me, what we're looking to do now is, um, thanks to genomics and, and, and other types of analytical um, procedures, we're now able to realise that not everyone is the same and not all their cancers are the same and we're able to stratify those patients according to the different drivers of those particular cancers. And depending on, um, on the, the, the type of driver, the type of switch, if you like, that uh, drives that cancer, you can be um, given a certain type of therapy to address that switch if one exists. And that's what we're doing. That's what Prescient's doing. This little quote from our, um, our CMO, talking about what that means in the context of, um, of our AML study where we've had, um, we've had three complete responses to date and I'll get back to that in a minute. So PTX200, um, it might be worthwhile, it's timely for us to revisit that last year. There was a flurry of announcements late last year that might have been lost on, on some of you just due to the timing of the announcements. And in any case, we've received some, um, some feedback to, um, to explain this a little further. So, um, breast cancer is one that we'll spend a little bit of time on today. So breast cancer is not one type of cancer, it's many different types of cancer that happen to just reside in the breast tissue. Um, so depending on the stats you look at, it could be one type of breast cancer or another, and it could be treated in one way or another. And what we're looking at is, uh, is HER2 negative disease, and in particular ER positive disease. These are the, these are the different um, receptors that are present on the surface of these cells and neoadjuvant therapy. What does neoadjuvant mean? It means the treatment that you get, the medicines you get prior to surgery. And nowadays, in fact, it was just um, 12 odd months ago, I think there was a paper showing that people should move from adjuvant. So um, it used to be sort of dealer's choice for a doctor whether they give treatment before surgery or after surgery. And now they're discovering, uh, they've discovered that you actually get better outcomes from a quality of life perspective with no difference in outcomes for clinically doing it beforehand. That's exactly where we are and it's the fastest growing segment of breast cancer. <coughs> and once again, you might hear a lot of noise about HER2 positive um, types of therapies. That's a, that's a bit of a crowded play for a drug developer. There's some well-established drugs addressing that particular receptor, but it only represents 20% of all breast cancers and we're looking to address the, um, the remaining 80%, which is comparatively you know, very, very underserved. And the particular switch that this drug switches off, which is AKT, is bad news in breast cancer. In many cancers, but in breast cancer in particular, where uh, if you have aberrant AKT, uh, a problematic AKT switch, if you will, not only does it mean you will um, have poorer outcomes, but in a cruel double whammy, um, you'll be resistant to therapy as well. So it stands to reason that you need to bring this particular switch under control in breast cancer. And once again, so this is uh, an, another little summary slide. So um, we're looking at neoadjuvant HER2 negative disease. And um, the, uh, it's a summary of the responses we saw. And I'll go through that in a minute where we got a very high response rate. And this was conducted, um, we firstly did a phase one study, which is you know, where you escalate the drug to demonstrate safety in combination with a chemo agent called paclitaxel, which in many uh, types of breast cancer is, um, has been a workhorse chemotherapy drug for many years. And we're adding our targeted therapy to that in, um, in the uh, neoadjuvant setting. And we'll go through some of the results now. So, we had, after the initial escalation component, we looked at 11 patients at our phase two recommended dose, and this was the, um, the phase two A result. So 10 patients treated, 
oh, pardon me, 11 patients treated and 10 are valuable. And I'll get to that in a minute. And as you can see there, we had two complete responses and eight partial responders. So basically, um, everyone that was observed responded, which is, which is great news. And this is determined pathologically. That's what the little P stands for, is that um, the surgeon goes in and takes a sample of the tissue and looks at it un, you know, under the microscope and determines once and for all, which is um, better than um, scans these days, for now anyway. Uh, whether there's any remaining cancer cells after the therapy. You can see that one patient where it was listed as not available um, at the bottom there, it's got the little asterisk. Sadly, this patient passed away um, prior to, after, after receiving PTX200 and Paclitaxel and was on a, uh, another uh, chemo regime called AC therapy just prior to surgery. She had a bad reaction to uh, doxorubicin, which is a which is a chemotherapy agent and passed away prior to surgery, uh, which is, which is um, unfortunate. Um, but it's worth mentioning, um, at least for the sake of this data, that that patient presented with a, a melon-sized tumour, um, the size of a, of a cantaloupe, a, a very, very big tumour. And after treatment with PTX200 and paclitaxel, it had disappeared. Um, and it's a shame that the patient um, had um, complications for due to other things, but um, uh, even under autopsy, that it had determined that there was um, that there was uh, a complete absence of disease there, which is amazing. So um, you can see of the ten patients that we could observe, all of them responded, and one that we weren't able to count as our data with a little asterisk there was nevertheless a clinical complete response. Once again, so again, um, we were not just in breast cancer, we're in uh, a leukaemia drug called, uh, a le uh, type of leukaemia indication called acute myeloid leukaemia, and also in ovarian cancer. <coughs> and um, just, to, just to talk about, if you could back up a minute, sorry, um, just on AML as the previous, uh, one of the earlier slides showed, there was, um, uh, we had, we've now had three complete responses in relapsed and refractory AML. Just so you know, AML is an incredibly difficult disease of, of uh, the, the, the blood, of the bone marrow, where um, you know, people progress very, very quickly. Um, and once you're resistant uh, and other therapies no longer work, it's unfortunately a very short life expectancy for these patients. And they're the patients that we're treating. These are not newly diagnosed patients who have a little bit longer. These are end-of-the-line patients for whom other therapies do not work. And to see three um, clinical responses, uh, complete responses so far, complete absence of disease, is really encouraging. Um, we have seen some really weird um, toxicities with that drug that we did not see in a monotherapy study. So in this exact indication, with, um, there was a previous phase one study with over 40 patients done in the US with um, our drug alone, and we saw nothing like this. Um, so we know it's not our drug by itself. So perhaps there might be some sort of um, overlapping drug-drug interaction, and we're making a protocol amendment now to space out those two drugs. So to give our drug first and then allow a, a, a day or two more before we give the, the chemotherapy agent, hopefully give all the benefits of the drug, uh, but minimising some of these weird drug-drug interactions. Uh, and also we're in ovarian cancer, we put out an update um, uh, in December as well, where um, once again, uh, once women are, are resistant to platinum-based chemotherapy, there's precious little else for them. And that's driven by AKT, and we're, we haven't even hit the optimal dose of that yet, and we've seen um, eighty percent disease control, which is you know, in that setting pretty encouraging. So it's clear that the drug's got some sort of activity, uh, which is great. And I think what we're doing now, as per some of the releases, is you know making protocol amendments with respect to AML. Look to um, do a, a new combination with respect to PTX two hundred to chase that ER positive population you know, to to follow the data basically, and in addition, trying to initiate some studies under, um, you know, in Australia or um, under grant funding to get better mileage.
Now, this is one we've received a lot of inquiries about, which is our work with uh, our work in CAR T, uh, and we're doing that. In the, there's a number of strings to this bow, and you'll hear more and more about that as um, as the year goes on. Um, the thin edge of the wedge is our collaboration with a private company called Carina Biotech, which was spun out of a cooperative research centre here in Australia, and they've got particular expertise in in manufacturing and CAR-T constructs. And we can't talk too much about this, but you can expect some, some more news on this this year. Um, but what's fascinating about this, this is, um, we hope, the first domino to fall in this really, really exciting area of CAR-T. And so let me just explain what CAR-T is. So as you can see there on the left, you've got a normal, a normal T cell, and then you've got a CAR T cell on the other side. Um, but what this is doing, basically, um, T cells are the, the cells in your body that uh, can recognise and and kill um, foreign invaders, if you like, you know, that, be it be it a virus, be it bacteria, um, and and even cancer. The, and you know, most of your most of the problematic um, cells that you know, cancerous cells that your body is producing, you would probably never know it, but your T cells are probably picking them up and removing them. Unfortunately, for uh, patients who present with cancer cells, it's because their 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 cells, their cancer cells, have found a way of evading the surveillance of the um, the uh, your T cells. So, what you're looking to do here, this this is a really nifty therapy where you're harnessing the body's own immune system. So you the, you draw blood from the patient uh, and you expand those. Up. You you then genet genetically manipulate those outside of the body to recognize the cancer cells. So you put a receptor on these cancer cells and what you're doing, you're basically turning a, 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 a docile um, T cell that will bump around a cancer cell and not recognize it. You're turning it into a sniffer dog um, that can sniff out the cancer and, and attack it. And then once this change is made and, and this modification is being made to turn it into this attack dog, they're expanded up, still outside of the body and then they are re-injected about 22 days later, they're re-injected back into the patient. These own, the patient's getting an improved version of their own cells back. And um, as you can see, um, yeah, the, the patient's back under the care of the clinician as they're getting their own cells back. So that's a summary of CAR-T and it's had spectacular responses in a certain type of cancer called, a certain type of blood cancer called B-cell cancers. And until the end of last year, I think a number of people were, uh, the industry and, and, and doctors were sitting on the fence thinking, well, this is fantastic in B-cell cancers. What else can we apply this to? Is it really here to stay as a modality? And we saw in December last year some data come out, some spectacular data using a couple of other targets in a couple of other in initially blood cancers showing that, okay, there's utility here beyond these B-cell cancers. And, beyond these certain types of targets. Um, so um, I think it's what it's, it's really re-energised um, a lot of the fence sitters there and people are, are now appreciating that I think CAR-T is, is here to stay. This is a little bit of a clunky business model initially um, as you've got to take the patient's own blood cells but people are looking at off-the-shelf solutions and where you can um, be able to take T cells off the shelf and manipulate them and give them to patients quite quickly and at a lower price point. This is basically Betamax. As, as spectacular as some of these results are, this is as um, crude as CAR-T is ever going to get. It's only going to improve and we are looking um, with um, Karina to uh, address some of these um, some of these problems and this is where you will find prescient looking to make a difference is helping overcome a lot of these challenges that are uh, until now stopping CAR-T being a more broadly accepted um, you know, landscape changing therapy uh, and I can't wait to tell you about that as the year unfolds. And as I said this is some of the current current limitations of CAR-T so I got ahead of myself getting a bit excited. So some of the some of the limitations, the cost and the time of they're, they're very closely linked as you can imagine getting a patient in getting their cells out and then patient by patient expanding those is um, is very time um, intensive and labor intensive. 
And um, once you administer these back to the patients, it's a bit of a runaway train. These cells just do what they do and clinicians do not have the type of control they would administering normal traditional medicines and uh, patients have to be in intensive care as they receive this. Uh, and also limited targets, different types of cancers and uh, that you can target and whether these cancers actually shed some of these targets. We're looking to solve some of these problems. And again, the thin edge of the wedge is where the marriage of um, cell therapies, CAR-T therapies and um, some of our drugs and that is um, where we're at with Karina right now. But our activity in this space is not limited to our work with Karina. But this, this was the thin edge of the wedge, as I like to say. Rightio, so <coughs> having just got back from JP Morgan, people are wanting to know what's happening in the, in the field of personalised medicine and targeted therapies in particular. And it's always encouraging to see this was from the, um, towards the latter end of last year, showing that the GIL activity was exceptional in targeted therapies and it's, uh, it's thought to stay hot, which is good. We haven't seen too much GIL activity this year yet. And in particular, the themes within this, um, the hottest of the hot areas, they think are drugging the, drugging the undruggable targets. And uh, what they mean by that is, is RAS, KRAS. And as you know, Prescience PTX100, which is currently in a basket study here in Australia, is an inhibitor of a disruptor of the RAS pathway. You can see some of the deal activity there. And what we haven't even shown there is some of the deal activity in... Um, you know, in RAS, but suffice to say that, you know, at least in the case of LOXO and Array, some of the some of the team members involved in the foundation of those medicines that resulted in those deals are, are working with us, which is uh, in, incredible for, for us to have exposure to that. And, and there's barely a day when RAS is not in the headlines overnight. And uh, I bother Patrick with, with updates every night and um, it's, it's in the headlines all of a sudden and I think there'll be a lot of eyes on us as this trial unfolds towards the end of this year and throughout this year. And two of the big uh, the big guys, Amgen, a huge company, um, sort of broke the ice with RAS this year. They thought it was an undruggable target until um, ASCO uh, 2019, where they showed some activity in a very small subset of RAS called G12C, and th their stock went through the roof. And on pure neurology, a... A uh, company working in the same area called Marathi um, went through the roof just because they were working in the same field and they've, they've shown comparable data with their G12C and they've got one in preclinical development too. And then there's little old Prescient as well. There's not a great many companies working in the field of RAS. It was a, a lonely space um, until not long ago. So I think right space, right time for us having this study underway um, right now. So. Um, yeah, it'll be good, our jobs, to um, get that trial enrolled and um, increase our um, yeah, external awareness of these of these trials, and then hopefully they'll work out. So that's, that's where we are. You can see that there's a little bit of a difference in the valuation between us and some of these peers, and I'm not suggesting that it's all due to, uh, to RAS, but I think it highlights that it's an exciting space and that markets have reacted to... Um, to progress um, in the field of RAS. And that's it. So you know, it, was a, it was a busy year um, last year. Um, I'm very proud of our team we, who um, continue to punch above their weight and deliver on, on um, varied fronts. We're not sitting still. We are, um, we are not only progressing our current clinical programs, but looking to um, really um, occupy a niche while the window exists to jump through that window with CAR-T and really own some of that space. So, and I cannot wait until I'm able to tell you more about that. So happy to answer any questions you might have. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, <laughs> there are quite a few questions there. So I'll start from the very beginning. Um, all right. So Sue has asked the question, for management, researchers at Cardiff University suggest a new T cell offering hope of a one-size-fits-all cancer therapy. Does this mean that PTX is irrelevant down the road? I do not. Um, every you know, you know, every so often you see um, 
things like this come out of universities. It's normally done at a university press office where they pump things up to be perhaps a little bit further developed than they are. This sounds very early. So, but I can't comment on Cardiff's research, but what it sounds like is um, their progress in the field of allogeneic T cells. So you might remember the diagram I showed earlier of um, the patient has to go into the hospital for CAR T therapy and get blood drawn, isolate the cells and expand them up. It sounds like um, these are one of the many people trying the off-the-shelf solutions, um, which if that is true, we are totally agnostic on. I could not care less if the um, T cells came from the actual patient or if, or if they're off the shelf and it's not a debate I need to have because the sorts of problems that we're looking to solve are agnostic on that. All right. Howard, I think your questions might be in here. Uh, let me have a look. Uh, Bennett, hi, Stephen. I able to disclose when the remaining 23 patient outcomes will be published for PTX200 2B. <coughs> breast cancer trial. So, so if you look at the announcement, so this was a Simon's two-stage design in two parts, 11 patients and then another 15. <coughs> I'm not sure if you're referring there to the to the 27 odd patients in the 1B component which we've announced already. <coughs> Pardon me. But um, that's the results from the 2A. Rather than progress with, with paclitaxel alone as it is now, um, as we mentioned in that, we think we need to pivot to endocrine therapy, which is the sweet spot of what we're doing, which is ER positive disease. And we'd expect by virtue of working in combination with endocrine therapy to hormone therapy, if you like, to have um, to remove much of the toxicities that we've seen associated with all of these awful chemo agents. So that's what we're, what's, what we're exploring now. A uh, question from Dragon, uh, why did Paul Hopper leave the board? Why did Paul Hopper leave the board? Um, I'd love to um, you know, stoke the fires of conspiracy theory. There are none exactly as it's said on the label. Paul, as you know, is an entrepreneur and um, uh, very, very active with his various personal projects. And his personal project portfolio got to the stage now where he had to sort of resign a couple of a couple of um, commitments. He felt that he'd um, contributed as much as he could um, with prescient for the moment, but absolutely no bad blood. I speak to Paul. He's got no intention of selling his shares. He advised me and happy to communicate that to investors. There's a lot of love there and um, <laughs> no will will and nothing more than we said in the announcement. Uh, okay, so there, there's a question here, and I might have first go at answering this. But because sure. when people ask questions, we we well, and, uh, you know, we read them out. So why isn't the share price responding to trial results? Um, I'm not sure that Stephen is able to uh, directly comment on anything to do with share price. It's kind of uh, restricted in that regard. But I would say that um, you know uh, the consistent flow of news we've seen a share price go up we've seen some sellers we've seen it go back down um, we just think that um, with the news flow uh, that's going through uh, it's all positive and that uh, it will be it will respond at some point in time in a very, <coughs> in a very positive way we've seen we did see a little bit of a gallop um, and it's still gone back to sort of previous levels but I would assume that um, at, at some point in time it will break through in a meaningful way. There's certainly been some very exciting press and they're in the right spots at the moment. What steps are being taken to ensure PTX won't follow Virax's fate with the HIV drug? Don't even know what happened with Virax's HIV drug. I was nothing to do with the company. Um, I, I, I don't know how to answer that. I think I think what you're talking about is um, perhaps, I'm, I'm having a stab here, perhaps technology redundancy um, and this is exactly what we're looking to do. We, look, make no mistake, I'm a big believer in PTX 100 and 200, but our um, stepping into CAR-T and exploiting a gap whilst one exists, because it won't exist forever, is really going to future-proof us, especially given that we're not backing any particular horse. We're looking at we're looking to be um, to solve some of these broader problems. Have it enabling solutions is going to future proof us, and I hope that addresses your question. Uh, Dragon, any uh, capital raising expected soon? No, there's no capital raising expected soon. 
<coughs> we have no plans. We remain on budget. What we raised nine odd mil last year. We've still got that in the bank. Um, the caveat being, of course, if someone offered offered a lot of money and it was at an acceptable price, I guess the board would have a look at that. But um, and if, the, if, if there was a new new use of funds, perhaps. But as we sit here today, absolutely no no capital raising. Okay. Uh, Royce asked a question again. This goes back to share price. There was some in De December three to positive results. Um, share price. Uh, what's PTX's view on share price volatility, particularly the seller following the short spike in share price? I think we go back to the fact that you know there's limited amounts that Stephen can comment on share price. What I would say um, from 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 I guess from our perspective and looking at the stock, it is something that we're very keen to introduce to our investors, uh, and for a number of reasons. But it requires education, um, and people need to understand what the opportunity is, the scale of the opportunity and how this works and the logic behind it. And so um, over December to January is not particularly a period of time where you go out and tell that story um, just due to the, to, to the fact that you know people are away or they're not looking at these particular things. So I think there is an opportunity to go and talk to the market about this. I think there are a lot of people that will be very, very interested in this particular stock. That's from my perspective. Stephen, anything yeah. you'd add to that? <coughs> well, I guess... There's a couple of things I think I can say. One is that no one's more frustrated in, about this than I am, believe me. Um, and I think last year there was um, a bit of a flurry around that activity. It's, well, it was encouraging to see the incredible volume that the stock can attract. So that's the positive for me. I don't think as, as the year reached its end and we were still putting out news, I guess there are more natural buyers than, so natural sellers than buyers as you... Uh, head into um, head into Christmas and shut up shop for the year. There are very few people opening their wallets and and, and um, making meaningful purchases on, on the share market at that time of the year. Um, but um, I guess yeah, the only thing I've I've had a bit of um, criticism levelled at me over the last little while about well, why can't you just put out more news? Why can't you just you know, just uh, just put out something? Well, that's not best practice and. Um, I think that's a very myopic way of, of doing things. We'll continue to do, but we, I wish I could control the share price, believe me. All I can control, I can't even control drug development. All I can do is execute on our current studies with the hope that uh, we, 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 we design the studies intelligently, we execute them with, um, with and report them with integrity, and hopefully they work, and fortunately to, to date they have which is good um, with the hope they build long-term value and um, continue to educate the uh, the share market. And, you know, as we showed in December, we'll, we'll find our time. And <laughs> we found our time, we'll find it again. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, Reach helping us with this uh, what is education the, process. What is the strategic importance behind the Carina um, partnership? Yeah, well, it's, the, it's our first foray into the CAR T space. And I say the first foray, there will be other things that you'll be hearing about. Um, this for me was screaming out, as I said, people sitting on after an initial burst of optimism in 2017, people sitting on the fence waiting for it to catch fire elsewhere and it hadn't for various technical and commercial reasons. And I saw a real opportunity for the company or the companies who were able to address some of those issues. And this is, the, our, our work with Karina will be the first step in that journey, and um, yeah, I'm just very but pleased. Why did you it. choose Karina? Why did we choose Karina? Well, you know, we were we were aware of one another. They had some expertise in an area that we did not, and we had expertise and drugs in an area that they did not. And it was a natural. I actually put the um, theory to them that the type of project, the type of problem that we're looking to solve. And I said, Are you aware that? our drug might be able to do this particular, solve this particular problem and their eyes lit up and that's how we... Yeah, so how if you had that. enough money and you wanted to go through that process, you could do it, could, is that, how far away would it be from... <coughs> well, for replicating mm. expertise, oh, yep. ex, expert, you can buy expertise. Yeah. Um, it's just, this was a cost effective um, and quick way of doing it because their expertise and relationships with the universities and whatnot yep. were already in place. But uh, we see no need to replicate 
wet labs and yep. and tons of expertise straight off the bat. But yeah, we'll we'll ease into that, I guess. Uh, Darren's asked, uh, what is the next news expected from PTX and when approximately? Uh, I'm probably unable to say anything other than through the ASX announcements um, for disclosure reasons. Um, let's have a look at this. Uh, how is PTX 100 tracking recruitment on track and is a read about still expected mid-year? No, so that, that was revised later uh, or about halfway through last year, we revised that to the end of this year. So that was hasn't been mid-year for a long time, that target. But, you know, we're looking to, well, we're screening all the time, which is good. We spoke with Miles Prince, our principal investigator, just over the weekend, and he's screening another patient now. So one thing we can't control is whether patients walk into the clinic at the right time, and, and if they do walk into the clinic, whether they'll be eligible to be enrolled, because let's not forget to... to get onto a study, you have to tick all of the boxes that we require, but also not tick any of the boxes that will um, preclude you from the study. And sometimes you find, might find someone who'd be the perfect candidate that has one little box ticked that uh, that um, makes them ineligible. So, you know, we're dealing with that and um, uh, we're on you know, looking to, to optimise our recruitment is probably the most we can say. Is there any scope to partner with other Paul Hopper companies? That's from Roy. No. Right. No, no. I mean, if, if, if the opportunity exists, and look, if we do something, it'll be because the science makes sense, not because Paul is involved necessarily. Okay. Daniel has asked, are there big inflection points this year? Again, asking same questions in different ways. I feel there will be, yes. Uh, someone's asked here whether recruitment will be faster in Australia. Not not necessarily faster. Um, we've had, I mean, we're a smaller population than in the US and there's competition for spots on studies. <coughs> but again, you know, we think the best we can do is have a brilliant PI who's enthusiastic about the program and that's what we've got. Okay. Um... I think Joe, the, the, Joe's asked a question that was covered earlier on. Yeah. Uh, this session will be recorded, so you'll be able to pick this up. We'll email it to everyone. Yeah. So, so yeah. just so you know, um, folks, so we're going through a lot of the questions. There's a lot of a lot of overlapping um, questions, as you can appreciate. Uh, Darren, you're asking a couple of questions uh, uh, that probably the disclosure of that information needs to wait for uh, ASX yeah. announcements. Um, but uh, nonetheless, very good questions. Um, yes, I wish I could answer some of these. <laughs> yes. um, yeah. uh, not without a CDA, which means you can't yeah. trade the stock. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Jeremy's asked, uh, uh, you know, have we uh, considered using platforms like Hot Cobble to assist in messaging among down investors of companies such as... Um, yeah, look, uh, Jeremy, we've got uh, a large distribution network. Um, from time to time, we'll use tactics like the ones you're suggesting um, but at the moment, we're going through uh, other channels. Um, no, I think people are asking: Are we are we looking at non-dilutive um, costs uh, and non-dilutive measures? Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, we were at pains to mention that in a couple of our announcement is that what we're looking at. Well, I'd love to do more trials in Australia so we can access more of the rebate. As you can imagine, there's two downsides to running trials in the US, like brilliant people and big centres, but we don't have access to the um, R&D rebate as much as we would like. And secondly, we've got a currency headwind. So there are two reasons to move them to Australia, but also to, to apply for funding. These, we're, and let's not forget, both of these um, drugs have um, gotten to where we are because they've been very successful in attracting um, funding in the past. We're just at the stage now where we've got to get, uh, we're, just got to carry it ourselves for a little bit, but we'll certainly be applying for additional funding for sure. Has PTX been approached by any large pharma companies <coughs> with interest in your research? Mario, um, a few other people have asked similar type questions. Anything yeah. you can say there? Yeah, look, that's that's a it's a loaded question because what I don't want to happen is for all the chat sites to go live with, oh, there's going to be a takeout, there's going to be a takeout. The short answer is, Mario, yes, we have been approached by... Um, many pharmaceutical companies, some of them very large and some, you know, companies that are 
considerably smaller, but still many billions of dollars, specialty pharmaceutical companies and whatnot, all of who have, have a folder on us. Um, does that mean there's a deal going to happen tomorrow? No, that's not how it works. Um, there is, I was you know, speaking to uh, uh, the CEO of a company that got bought out very recently and um, talking about the process, we're doing the same sort of thing, engage early, engage often, get them familiar with the science, get them familiar with the team. I just got back from JP Morgan where there were dozens of meetings there, again, updating um, people who have folders on us and, and seeing new parties as well. Um, well. You know what's really nice and I think it's worthwhile shareholders hearing this is that whenever I speak to these people who we meet at JP Morgan, we meet at Bio, we meet at Bio Europe, so two to three times a year there are interactions where they just want to keep a finger on the pulse of progress. And every time I see them, it is Stephen, well done, the team is, every time I see you, you're making progress and the progress is in the right direction, which is something we don't have control over, but they're always very complimentary on not just the programs, but on the progress. So I think I think you guys should hear that um, because we're using your money to progress it. I think that's worthwhile you hearing that. Okay. Um, a couple of questions regarding strategy. Um, is it to, you know, how far do you want to go with the project? When would you look at the buyout? Is it to pretty yourself up for that? Is there anything you just want to mention? Yeah, that's a really interesting um, question from Joe. Um, I think with PTX 200, I think we're probably nearing the end of the journey of what we can add ourselves without the studies getting very, very big. So we've taken the drug from discovery to preclinical, uh, all the preclinical work, then um, got it into the clinic and gotten, um, you know, gone through safety and then now clinical proof of concept. We're at a really important point. I think what makes sense for us to do, rather than run a 400 patient breast cancer study, for example, it's going to cost 80 mil US to run or, or more. Um, I think what makes sense for us is to look at add value by doing um, investigator sponsored studies and studies in new indications that will demonstrate to parties that there is um, you know, there is breadth to the value in addition to depth. With PTX 100, I think that might be a little bit different because this lends itself a little bit more to a, um, <coughs> a basket style study. Once again, we're, um, we would be at a stage where we think we can, we, we'd, we'd love to be able to partner this if the outcomes of these studies are positive and fingers crossed there. But if not, um, Joe, you'll recall you know, companies like Loxo that pioneered this one trial to launch where you can go to a pivotal study with a smaller number of patients enriched for these mutations. Now that is something that a smaller company can do themselves. So a little bit of an asterisk on that one. I think that's one we can take a little bit further or considerably further if we needed to. Yeah, It's a good position to be in. Okay, uh, a couple of questions around institutional investors, how you manage your institutional investors and the like. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Comment on that? Um, yeah, so we have good engagement with our institutional um, investors. I, I was with um, with all our main ones just in December, um, November, December. Um, look, at the end of the day, they do what they want. There was one investor in particular that had to make portfolio decisions across a whole bunch of biotechs and we got caught up in that as did a, did a handful of others, which is, you know, really disappointing because it came at the time when we were um, putting out good news. So it, um, that sort of muted that response. But all we can do is keep people informed. Um, whenever I hear one of these guys selling, they insist it's, well, it's, it's one of these parties selling, they insist it's a portfolio decision and, and not personal, but also we've got, um, as part of our investor relations strategy for this year, having um, a more hands-on account manager who's um, going to be, uh, who interfaces with them every day as part of their job uh, and um, more likely to get good engagement with them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Next, asks a nice question. Are you still personally enjoying your position with the company? Yeah, it depends on where the share price is at <laughs> on any given day and how many frustrated texts I get, Nick. But um, many thanks. I mean, it's um, am I enjoying it? Look, I enjoy the journey we're on. Like, it's tough. 
drug development is bloody tough and investors need to know just how tough it is. We can't turn the crank on the machine and spit out a good result. I mean, I can't guarantee you a result. I can guarantee you that what we're trying to do is get a result and sometimes the results aren't good. Luckily, so far they have been, but just want to make sure that we're aligned on that. So I can't guarantee the outcome, but I enjoy the journey. Um, I just let you in on you know, some, you know, whilst we're on you know, the subject of sort of personal information. My father's you know very ill at the moment with cancer, so I'm living with that um, you know right now. And I know that if we were to ask everyone on this call, I know that um, everyone's probably been touched first or second hand with cancer with someone they someone they know and love. So it's a personal journey for all of us. And uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm enjoying the journey and. I'm enjoying making a difference and um, whilst we can't help everyone, to know that there are a bunch of people across the AML studies and the breast cancer studies who are alive today because of our trials is enormously satisfying um, because it's not just them and their lives, right? It's, it's their family and their friends who get to enjoy more time with them yeah. and that's maybe the most noble thing you can do. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent, guys. I think if there's any questions you don't feel that you've asked that have been covered because there were quite a few questions that were asked in, in different ways, please let us know. Shoot us an email via the investor portal, send us an email in um, or respond to any of the communications you've received regarding uh, the webcast. We'll shoot out the recording of this session uh, to everyone and there's always any further questions come back with. And I know um, you know, uh, thanks to Joe who's made a comment about uh, Prescient being one of the best at shareholder communications. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's something that Stephen uh, believes in, engages in, and will uh, provide us feedback on specific questions. So, um, you know, if you need something, uh, please reach out. If you're not a current shareholder, uh, this is a very well run business commercially and obviously, but underneath it really stacks up as well. So, um, you know, get on, get involved. PTX is the code. Uh, follow it on the chat. Uh, sorry, follow it um, in your watch list. Uh, but right now I think represents some excellent buying opportunity as well. Um, and um, we look forward to keeping you updated. Stephen, I'll leave you with the last word. Yeah, just want to thank everyone for their time and, <laughs> and support if they're a shareholder. Um, we tried to answer all of the questions. Um, as best we could given the overlap in a lot of the questions and thanks for also appreciating there are some things that we can't comment on um, but you'll hopefully hear about in the fullness of time and looking forward to another great year so many thanks for your support.